Welcome everybody and thanks for the invitation to talk here. Uh, my name is Bram van Ginneke. I work at Radboud University Medical Center. It's a university medical center in the east of the Netherlands. And I also work for Fraunhofer Mavis in Germany. And I'm one of the founders of Dirona, a company in Nijmegen that um, is now developing the new versions of uh, cut for tb um, so these are my disclosures. We also work in my group with a lot of other companies because in my group we make software that analyzes medical images and eventually we would like to have this software used in uh, routine clinical care so that patients can benefit from the software. So I'm going to talk about the fundamentals of CAD and what is CAD and I think if you would ask many doctors they would say coronary artery disease but that is not the abbreviation we're talking about today. Uh, we're talking about uh, CAD as computer-aided diagnosis, and um, that's a very old term in um, medical image analysis. Here you see a paper from the 1960s. Um, this was uh, written by Willem Lodwig, a radiologist who first used the term computer-aided diagnosis, so he was already working on that in the 60s of the previous century. Uh, it's also often taken to mean computer-aided detection, so the terms are sometimes used interchangeably. And for example, in the recently released uh, guidelines from the WHO on uh, tuberculosis, um, where they for the first time recommend now to use computer-aided detection software for automated reading of chest x-rays, uh, they use the term computer-aided detection. And I want to start by uh, when I start to explain how this software works, what, what are the fundamentals of CAD, by pointing out that it is actually uh, very difficult to program a computer to see the difference between two images, both chest x-rays, and one of them here is an x-ray of somebody who is positive for tuberculosis, and one x-ray is an image from somebody who is negative for tuberculosis. If you would ask most people what is the difference between the two images, they would probably point to the necklace that one person is wearing, but that of course is not related to uh, tuberculosis. You have to somehow program into the computer some rules that allow the computer to say that this is the TB case because there is this abnormality here in the lung. And basically it's very difficult to write such computer software. So how do you do that? Here's a picture from NVIDIA. NVIDIA is the company making GPUs, graphic cards for gaming computers. And these gaming cards are nowadays used to train deep learning systems. And deep learning is now the best technology we have to teach computers how to interpret images. But we also often call it AI, artificial intelligence, and that is a field that started in the 1950s. Huh? So remember the, what I previously showed, 1963, people were already working on that. Um, and within artificial intelligence, there is a subset of algorithms called machine learning, where the machine, the computer learns from example data. And then recently we've seen that a special subset of machine learning called deep learning is very popular, especially for image analysis. And if you summarize what, what this means for our problem of teaching a computer to see the difference between an X-ray with TB and without TB, um, then if we work with classical artificial intelligence techniques that people used to work with, um, where they directly try to program into the computer what is the difference between an X-ray with TB and without TB, that doesn't really work. So these attempts where humans computer rules, uh, program rules into the computer are not very suitable for image analysis. With machine learning, you feed numbers into the computer and some numbers are from images that are positive, that have TB, and some numbers are from images that are negative. And computers are very good at uh, fitting a function to this set of numbers to predict whether it's a positive or a negative set of numbers. But still we have to first turn the image into a set of numbers. And that is difficult because what numbers are you going to compute from the images that are indicative for whether it's TB or not? So in machine learning, it's kind of a collaboration between humans and computers. It's difficult. And this is how we built the first versions of cut for tb Deep learning is the next step where we use a neural network 
to feed the image directly into a neural network or part of an image. And the neural network with all its weights gives us an output whether that image is normal or abnormal. And this neural network learns from example images for which it is known whether they're normal or abnormal. So there's not that much that humans have to program anymore. It's mostly done by computers. Humans still have to design what kind of networks are we actually going to use. Another drawback, you could say, of deep learning is that computers need a lot of example images in order to train these neural networks. So we need to collect a lot of data. But if you do that, it tends to work very well. So if you look now at um, the project that I started in 1996, cop 4 tb uh, it started as a PhD project and I started to work with a machine learning approach. And in 2001, we had a first system, but at that time, the market for digital X-ray machines, and you need a digital X-ray machine to have the image in a digital format so you can feed it to the computer. That market wasn't really existing in 2001. So we temporarily stopped with this uh, project. And here's the machine learning system that I made. What I basically did is I taught the computer how to find the lung fields. I divided the lung fields into these small regions. And then for each of these regions, I computed a set of numbers based on filters that you apply to the image. And then you extract numbers from these filtered images. And the computer then processes these numbers and says for each region, whether it's a normal or an abnormal region, and then you sum that up all together and you get a score for the image. So it's a classical machine learning approach. Now that uh, is something we started again in 2008 when uh, Delft Imaging Systems started to make digital X-ray machines and sell them all across the world. And we made software based on machine learning and had the first version released in 2011. And then in the years after that, we improved the software every year and we especially focus to make sure that the software would work with X-rays coming from different vendors, different X-ray machines. And that's not a trivial uh, matter. So we normalize the images so that they look the same, no matter from what X-ray machine they were coming, so that the software would not get confused. In 2014, we made an important step because we obtained CE marking for this software. And that means that it is an official medical device that you can use in a clinical routine. And after that, many countries started to use the software. In 2016, we made another version, version 5, where the software was a lot simplified and also faster. Um, um, so it could be applied more easily also at small computers that we would put next to the X-ray machine. But up until 2016, the software was all based on machine learning. And the software does two things. It creates this colored image called a heat map, where it indicates which regions the software thinks are abnormal, um, using an approach like I explained before. And it also computes from this heat map and some other analysis, a score from zero, which is completely normal, to 100, which is the most abnormal uh, the image can be. So in practice, if you use the software, you have to decide above which threshold 60, 70, or 80, you consider the image abnormal. So you would do, for example, a subsequent expert test. And then in 2018, we had our first deep learning version of the software finished. Um, and this year, uh, or version seven, which is an improvement of version six, has been finished now and will probably come out uh, this year. So they are both, both based on deep learning. So what is the difference? How does deep learning work? What you see here is a website that you can also go to yourself and play around with. You can draw a number here. In this example, I drew a four. And then you see the output of the network here. So I don't know uh, if you can all see that, but here at the top is the output. And this indicates that the computer thinks that this is a four because this is a bright neuron that had the highest has the highest output at the bottom is the image that i've drawn and that goes into the network and you can see it's a very small image it's a very pixelated image because this is a deep neural network from uh, 1998 so a very old one um, which could only process these very small images but in cut for tb we still use this that we have a small part of the x-ray and for every part of the x-ray we compute with such a network whether that part of the image is normal or abnormal. And we use that to create this heat map. So 
how does such a network work? The, uh, the image goes into some filters. So you first produce six filtered versions. Then you make the images smaller, you know, just smaller versions of these six filters. And then you make new filters, which use these six filtered images as input. You get these more complex output. You make these images smaller. Then you filter these images again. But now the images are so small that the output here is just a single number. And then we have a set of numbers. And from now on, it's a machine learning problem. We translate this set of numbers into a new set of numbers. And from these final set of numbers, we compute the probabilities uh, for each of the uh, 10 digits. So in this network there are connections, which tell you how to compute from one layer to the next. And there are weights, so numbers associated with all these connections. And these weights are learned by the network during the training process. And this particular deep learning network has 60,000 weights to learn. Uh, but current big uh, recent networks have like 60 million parameters that they have to learn. And thanks to these uh, powerful computer cards, this is now possible. Now, last year we published a, a study where we looked at the results of CAT4TB version 6 in uh, data from Pakistan. And what is shown in this plot is the result of the software versus expert as the reference standard. And you see that here for the different versions of CAT4TB. So version 3, which was not very capable of handling all the sorts of different machines, works a little bit less well. Version uh, 4 and 5 do better. And you see here that version 6 especially improved in this area. So what you see here is the sensitivity, how much of the TB positive cases do you find, versus 1 minus specificity. And that is how often does the software raise a false alarm? So you want never a false alarm. A normal image should never be considered abnormal. So you want to be low here and high here. You want to be in the upper left corner of this, um, of this graph. And this curve basically shows the performance of the software sensitivity and the specificity when you vary this threshold. And you see that version six was better at finding the more subtle abnormalities because at this point you have already found 80% or 90% of the abnormals to find the remaining tens. So uh, version uh, six really improves there. And we tested also on a subset where we asked human experts to grade the images. And you see that the human experts actually perform comparably to version six. Maybe this observer is still a little bit better. And here's a sneak preview of version seven uh, on the same data set. So now the blue line is version seven and the orange line is version six from the previous graph. And you see that version seven has a, again, a much better performance than the previous versions. Uh, so it can find 80% of the TB cases with only 5% false alarm rate. And uh, it can find almost 100% uh, of the TB cases with only 25% false alarm rate. So you would have to do less expert um, tests in order to find all TB cases. If we look at the performance relative to the human observers, we see that the new software is now actually outperforming all human readers. And these are results from one big data set from Pakistan. Um, but of course, you should test this on your, your own data to find out if, uh, if this software works in your setting. What we're also doing, and I don't have time to go over all of that in this talk, is um, extend the software to detect other things besides tuberculosis. We have a version for pneumonia, which is useful to differentiate TB from regular pneumonia. And these, all these extra things may be included in newer versions of the software, but they're not in cut for tb yet. Um, there's also a special version that's a separate product that's also on the market, cut for covid which detects uh, COVID-19 pneumonia. And we are currently experimenting in Lesotho with an, an extended version, which also takes blood markers into account. So not only the X-ray, but also blood markers to get even higher performance in differentiating uh, COVID-19 from tuberculosis. There is a version that we have made for silicosis, which can be used to uh, screen at the same time for silicosis and TB, which is commonly done in uh, mine workers. There's a version that detects cardiomegaly and enlarged heart. And that's something that also is often reported in TB screening programs. We have worked, uh, we are still working on improving a version that detects lung cancer. We have a current version which works quite okay, but we're further improving that. 
And that's becoming increasingly important because uh, a lot of the countries with high TB rates also see a, an increasing incidence of uh, lung cancer because uh, the population starts to smoke more. And then we have a special version of pediatric pneumonia, and that's a common cause of death for young infants. And cut for tb has been extended in version 6 to um, analyze images of um, children also, four years and older. But we are working on a version that also works on uh, younger children, especially for pediatric TB in a collaboration with the uh, University of Stellenbosch. So these are things that maybe in the future will be included in the software. I have to realize that because of deep learning, there are now many products on the market that analyze medical images. Uh, our group maintains a website for that. If you go to this website, you can see all products that have a CE certification or an FDA certification for radiology. And you see that in total today, there are 166 products on the market. Now on this website, you can also search for uh, subspecialties. So if you look for chest and X-ray, you find 22 products. If you then also look for tuberculosis, you find five products. So there are currently five CE approved products that uh, claim to detect tuberculosis in chest X-ray on the market. So in summary, um, I think it's uh, important to realize that thanks to the breakthrough of deep learning, it's now possible to make a software that analyzes medical images and achieves human level performance. And that is now used in over 100 products for radiology that are on the market today. Uh, you often hear that AI uh, is a black box and that you, as a user, do not really understand why the software comes to a certain decision. We try to counteract that in cut for tb and also in other products by, for example, including this heat map, which tells you where the system is locating an abnormality. So you have an idea why the computer arrives at a certain conclusion. I have to realize that if you use AI systems for the detection of TB or other diseases, that um, they produce a probability. They don't say yes, no, but they give some kind of percentage. So what you do then with that output is something you have to decide. You have to choose whether you go for high sensitivity or high specificity. And that depends on your setting. So it depends whether you do scre triaging, screening, or active or ca uh, passive case finding. And we recommend that you always measure the ROC curve, so these curves that I showed on your own data. And also realize that you, when you remember it, when you compare it to a reference standard, that the reference standard is also not always perfect. And I showed all these other things that software can also detect on chest X-rays. I think that is very nice, and that's probably the way things are going, but you always must realize um, if you would use software that detects uh, all sorts of other signs on a chest X-ray, what are you going to do if you detect these abnormalities? Like if you don't have any capacity to, uh, to operate on lung cancer patients, then making a diagnosis of lung cancer uh, may not be something that you can actually action upon. And you have to realize that if you have a software that detects like 50 different abnormalities on chest X-rays, every detector will also give you false positives. So at some point, um, you have to have a good strategy how to deal with all of that. Now, that was my introduction into CAD. And uh, with that, I'd like to end my presentation.